Hello and welcome to this first PowerPoint. We're looking at uh, WJEC Criminology Unit 2. This is the exam unit. I'm going to take you through this uh, assessment component by assessment component. I'm going to start with assessment component 1.1, which is entitled Compare Crime and Deviance. Now, the reality is for the exam, all you're going to really need to know on this part of the course is have a really clear definition of what crime is and how it differs from deviance, where the two cross over, and perhaps have some examples of crime and deviance, and also the sanctions that we as a society impose for crime and deviance. However, in this PowerPoint, I'm going to go through it in quite a bit of detail, because this then sets the stall for the rest of the course. And some of the stuff that I'll be looking at in this PowerPoint will be pertinent for the rest of the course, will be useful to, uh, to you. So without further ado, let's make a start. So, as I've said, this topic requires you to look at crime and deviance. You've got to understand the two terms, similarities, differences, etc. So let's start with the idea that crime and deviance challenge or threaten accepted values and norms of behaviour. Now, what do we mean by a value and a norm of behaviour? Well, our value, values are our general principles or guidelines of how we live our lives. They're how we define what's right or wrong, what's good and bad. So um, things like respect for human life would be what we call a value. In, in British schools recently, we were required to talk about British values, which were democracy, rule of law, individual liberty, respect and tolerance. I find it somewhat ironic that we called these British values. I would think these are values that are shared by all countries, to be quite honest. So that's what we mean by a value. When we come to the idea of norm, a norm, just think of the word normal here, is a specific rule or socially accepted standard. So it's basically what is the normal thing to do within society? What's the normal way to behave? So norms govern our behaviour in particular situations. And of course, norms will differ from culture to culture. So you might want to think about what our societal norms, the norms we have in UK society are, or indeed the norms that you have in your school. So, for instance, you could argue that in Britain it is customary to queue. We're very good at queuing. That's a norm in our society, queuing for a bus um, or opening a door for an old person or someone who is disabled or giving up your seat on a bus, likewise for someone who is old or disabled. In some schools, like the one I teach at, um, not for sick formers, but certainly for key stages three and four, it is the norm to stand up when an adult enters a classroom, but that might not be the case in all schools. So as you see, they will differ from society to society, from place to place. And as I was taught when I was a child, whenever you get a birthday present or a Christmas present, it's the norm to write a thank you letter. Now that's what I was taught in my family, but you may, it may be different in yours. So norms do change from place to place, society to society. So, we can define a norm as a specific rule or socially acceptable standard that governs our behaviour in particular situations. So obviously norms in a society are linked to that society's values and they keep in check deviant behaviour. Now we'll define deviant behaviour in more detail in a minute. And of course norms can be explicit, such as laws, or implicit, such as unwritten rules. And norms are learnt through growing up in a particular culture. Now, when we come to defining deviance, it's really quite simple. If you violate a social norm, that is deviance. So deviance is the act of violating a social norm. So it therefore follows, and please guys, just remember this by definition, and I'm talking about the definition here, so by definition, all crime is deviant by definition. Doesn't mean that as a society we see all crime as being deviant, but by definition, crime has to be deviant because it is violating a social norm and it's violating an explicit social norm. It's violating a law. So by definition, all crime is deviant. But 
not all deviance is crime. And if I was answering a question on crime and deviance, I'd be really making sure that I got these two little bits into any answer. So obviously stealing a car is deviant and it's a crime, whereas having multiple tattoos and putting um, horns and studs into your face is definitely not the norm so it's deviant but there isn't a law against it therefore it's not criminal so obviously both of these are deviant but only one is criminal just as this would be seen as deviant as well in a different society so let's explore deviance in more detail so we know it's differing from the norms of society it's offending against norms, offending against moral codes and values held by the society in which the deviance occurs. Now, your moral codes are your basic set of rules, values and principles that are held by an individual, a group, an organisation or indeed society as a whole. So they can be written down. They could be the law. Um, so you could have the police code of ethics. Uh, which if you want to look at, I put a link to here, or you can look at teacher standards. So uh, that's a written guide of core principles and standards that the police code is for officers, the teachers is for teachers. So as a teacher, um, here's a clip of what I'm expected to be. Uh, I've just again, taken a screenshot. You can look in more detail by clicking on the link. I'm expected to set high expectations, which inspire and motivate and challenge pupils. I've got to promote good progress and outcomes. I've got to demonstrate good subject curriculum knowledge, etc., etc., etc. So those are the standards, the norms, the principles, the moral codes by which a teacher is judged. And breaking a moral code, as I said before, would generally be considered serious in society. If I don't uphold those teacher standards, I would lose my job. If the police don't uphold their code of ethics, they would lose their job. You don't uphold the law, you go to prison, you get a fine, etc. So, as we see, it deviance is any behaviour that differs from the norm or the normal. It's behaviour that's unusual or uncommon. It's out of the way. In some way, it's uh, extraordinary. So, it can be seen in different ways usually in the textbooks it focuses on the negative types of deviance but there can be positive types of deviance so you could have behavior that's unusual but it's good such as heroically saving one's uh, using risking one's life to save someone else this uh, u.s marine here is being given the congressional medal of honor by the then president barack obama because he uh, barack obama uh, because he threw himself on a grenade to save uh, his comrades um, and he's cut, suffered uh, loss of an eye, disfigurement, etc. And that would be seen probably as deviant behaviour because it's not the norm for people to do that. Or you could have behaviour that's unusual and eccentric or bizarre, such as talking to trees in the park or like this couple here, huding hoard quantities of old newspapers. Or you can have behaviour which is more what we're dealing with in this course that's unusual, bad or disapproved of, such as physically attacking someone for no reason whatsoever. So now we've defined what um, deviance is, what are the sanctions? In any question you get on deviance, try and show what sanctions we give against deviance. Now, obviously, if it's a crime, you can have a formal sanction. So that's formal sanctions imposed by official bodies such as the police, the courts, schools, other institutions. So they're punishments for breaking the rules or the laws. So for instance, a court may fine an offender for theft or schools can exclude pupils for bullying. And of course, you then have informal sanctions, which you, you used when the rules aren't formally written down. They're more unspoken. So when someone breaks these rules, others show their disapproval in informal ways, such as they don't refuse to speak to them, they tell them off, they give them dirty looks, that sort of thing. So that's what we mean by an informal sanction. Tutting at someone, you know, you giving me evils would be an informal sanction. So you might be able to think of some other informal sanctions as well. For instance, um, the sort of informal sanctions I would give for my children when they were naughty was make them sit on the naughty step when they were children. So 
that might be an informal sanction. So, if we look at positive sanctions, because uh, the textbooks tend to focus on the negative, so we look at crime and deviance, and usually it's negative sanctions we're putting, they can be positive, so you could give positive sanctions for behaviour that society approves of, so such as medals for sporting achievement. Uh, so, you know, here we have uh, the Olympic um, eight uh, bronze medalists. The reason I put them out there is because that guy there, Jacob Dawson, I taught. And of course, you can have, uh, if you are teacher of the week, such as this bloke here, uh, we'll get a little cup. Oh, that was the teacher of the month, actually. And a uh, certificate saying you're teacher of the week, making me feel all proud and uh, chuffed, or not as the case may be. So they can be formal and informal. And all this links to this idea of social control. So all sanctions that we have, both formal or informal, positive or negative, are ways of controlling us, ways of making sure that we conform to the norms, the morals, the values of society. And social control will feature massively in Unit 4, where we look at the different institutions within the criminal justice system that ensure that we toe the line and society behaves in the way we want it to. So social control is the way in which we are controlled in our behaviour and so that we conform to the norms and values of society. So the very fact that we have security cameras or speed cameras controls our behaviour. If I'm bombing along the motorway over the speed limit and I see a speed camera, I slow down. This controls my behaviour. It's getting me to abide by the norms and values and the laws of our society. So that's what we mean by social control. Now, when we come down to criminal behaviour, remember that all deviant behaviour by definition is criminal. But when we get to criminal behaviour, that's a more serious form of deviance. That involves serious harmful acts that are wrong against society. And they're deemed to be so disruptive that the state intervenes and forbids them and punishes them by law. Now, we're now going to go through to the legal definition of what a crime is. So if you want to get, you know, the real top marks, get these nice Latin terms in. So in law, criminal behaviour is any action that's forbidden by criminal law. So in general, a court, for a court to consider a defendant's action to be a crime, the action's got to have two elements. And that is, it's got to have in Latin what's called an actus reus. So the act itself has got to be guilty. So it's got to be wrong. It's got to be illegal. But at the same time, you've got to have a mens rea. So a guilty mind. So the, the intention behind it is guilty. So in general, remember I'm saying in general, there are exceptions here. But in general, in the court of law, for it to be a crime, it's got to be an actus reus and a mens rea. So in other words, the defendant must have done something that the law forbids and they must have done it with bad intentions. So here I am. Um, I want to hurt this person badly. So my mens rea is thinking I'm going to give him a good thumping. I smack him in the head, which is actually assault. So it's a, an actus reus is against the law. Therefore, I've got both. So therefore, it is a crime. Simple as. I did mention there are exceptions, though. So let's talk about these, because sometimes a question linked to this does come up. So in the case of strict liability, in some cases, mens rea isn't required. You don't have to have that guilty mind, that intention. The wrongful act itself is enough to convict. So this normally happens in cases of such so things such as negligence, when health and safety laws are broken. So to give you an example, um, I'll give you a clip of this in a minute, but there's the link. Um, here you have Hemel Hempstead Tesco was fined 730,000 uh, uh, after a man of 91 slipped and broke his hip. Now you can see here, um, 91 year old man broke his hip when he slipped on water on the floor of one of the stores. 
the water had been leaking for a block drain since June. Luton magistrates were told Tesco pleaded guilty to two charges of health and safety breaches. Now, there's no way that Tesco intended for that 91 year old man to break his hip. But nevertheless, the fact that they left water on the floor means that uh, the actus rea, uh, the actus rea was enough without the mens rea. OK. Uh, so the actus reus was enough there. So strict liability. And the other example you can use is self-defense. So assaulting someone, obviously hitting someone is an actus reus. Uh, deliberately intending to harm them would be a mens rea. It's usually a criminal act. However, if it's done in self-defense, it's not always a crime, so long as you use reasonable force. And the example you can use, uh, captain of the England cricket team, Ben Stokes, um, he was charged with a fray a while back in Bristol. Um, you can click on the link to get more details of this. But he was um, he was found not guilty because he was stepping in to defend someone who was being homophobically abused. So you can have a look at that at your leisure. So that's what we mean by exceptions to actus reus and mens rea. And you can use those examples if you so wish. So the other thing to also consider here, and this is just getting you to start to think about how we go on to the next uh, element of the uh, next AC in this unit. Uh, but the idea that crime is crime an absolute thing or is it merely relative? In other words, is it just defined socially and does it differ? So some people would argue that crime is just a social label. It's an interaction. It's a wrong against the community. So it's basically saying if society said an act is a crime, then it becomes one. So if its consequences are detrimental in some way to the community, then the community decides it's a crime. But what this means is, and I've mentioned this before, in that some societies, certain things will not be seen as criminal, whereas others will. So in our society, you know, some crimes are universally approved or uh, disapproved of. So, for so example, sex offences are universally approved of in our society, especially those involving children. However, some acts are crimes in some countries, but not in others. For instance, most people in the UK would think it's wrong to have sex with a 14 year old. However, the age of consent, the age in which you are legally allowed to have sex, does differ from country to country. To illustrate this, I've got this little chart for you, and you can see looking at um, various places around the world, the age of consent completely differs from country to country. In Argentina, it's 13. In Morocco, it's 15, but not for homosexuals. In Ghana, it's 16. Uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, it's 14 for females, 18 for males. In New York, it's 17. In Brazil, it's 14. So this just goes to show you this idea that it's a societal um, idea, you know, this idea of what a law is. It's something that societies themselves make up. So there are differing views of acts that are really criminal. Remember, I said by definition, all crime is deviant. Well, in this slide, we're going to explore where there might be some exceptions to that. So the public will often have a different view of which acts are really crimes compared to the legal definition. For example, many people might not see themselves as criminals, fair dodgers, motorists to go a little over the speed limit, users of soft drugs, workers who take home stationery from the office, you know, all these sort of little things. So, you know, going over the speed limit, you know, everyone does it. It's a crime. But do people think it's criminal? You know, who's borrowed a pen or a bit of paper from the office? Uh, technically, it's stealing, but people don't see it as that. Um, how many of you have illegally downloaded a movie or, um, or, 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 or songs from the Internet? But it's not viewed as being a crime. Soft drugs, fair dodging. And how many of you, I wonder, have gone on to the uh, BBC website um, and clicked, oh, I've got a TV license, when actually you don't. Technically, you're breaking the law. So the society does have different views of criminal behaviour. So some things that are legally crime, so by definition a crime and therefore deviant, are not seen as deviant within some societies because everyone does it. It's the norm to break. 
So criminal acts are ones that break the law, as we know. There are many different types of criminal acts which we can classify in their seriousness and their subject matter. So generally, if we look at seriousness of the offence, the UK law distinguishes between two main types of offence. You've got summary offences. Again, you're going to need this for the rest of the course. Summary offences are less serious. They're tried in a magistrate's court and they're crimes such as speeding and shoplifting. And there's a magistrate's court. Over 90% of all crimes are tried in a magistrate's court. Notice in a magistrate's court, there's no jury. And instead, you've got three magistrates who are actually members of the public and they make the decision as to the guilt. Or you've got your indictable offences, which are much more serious, like rape, murder, etc. And they are tried in a crown court with a jury and a judge, etc., etc. So remember those two terms, summary offences and indictable offences. The use of technical vocabulary gets you more marks in any answer you give in the exam. So when we look at acts that are criminal, they can be criminal based on subject matter. So it can be uh, violence against a person. So that can be crimes like murder, manslaughter and assault. It can be sexual offences, rape, sex, trafficking, grooming. It could be offences against property, such as burglary, theft and robbery, fraud and forgery, such as investment fraud or Ponzi schemes. We'll find out a bit more about those in other parts of the course. Criminal damage, such as arson, vandalism, if you want, or drug offences, such as supplying and possession of heroin. Or public order offences, riot and violent disorder. Now, when it comes to sanctions, it's really important you understand the four categories of formal sanctions that we have in law in our society. So anyone that's convicted of a crime will receive one of these four sanctions, okay? And they can be imposed by the court or the police, okay? But in the court, four formal sanctions are handed out, four categories. You have to know these four categories. The first category is a custodial sentence. So basically, you go to prison and they are given for serious offences. So that's imprisonment in, a, in an adult prison or a young offenders institution. And the length of that sentence can vary from days up to, if you commit murder, a mandatory life sentence. So if you are found guilty of murder, you will get a life sentence. The judge has to give you a life sentence. Um, usually after a life sentence you're eligible to parole for about after about 15 years however courts could impose a much longer minimum sentence in more serious cases so um, the guy that was responsible for um, the Manchester uh, evening arena bombing the Ariana Grande concert assisting in that he was given a life sentence and I think he's mandatory he's got to serve a minimum of over 40 years I believe it is so they can be very long sentences indeed the minimum um, sentence given second category we have is community sentenced so this is where you see community pay, uh, payback, etc. Now, they are served in the community rather than in jail, and that can include a probation order, a curfew, uh, tagging, attendance at anger management courses, mandatory drug testing, treatment orders, community payback. is anything that involves having not serving your time in jail, but doing it in the community. So prison sentences, community sentences. The third category is fines. Uh, these are you know, basically financial penalties of the size of the fine will depend on uh, the seriousness of the offence and the ability to pay it by the offender. Sometimes you pay in instalments. And the f so there you go, £1,000 fine. Uh, or it's a discharge. Now, so prison, community, fine. And the discharge is the one that everyone forgets. So discharge, a conditional discharge, if you can, these discharges can either conditional or unconditional. If we have a conditional discharge, that involves the offender committing no further offence for a given period. If they do commit an offence during this, the court can impose a sentence for the original offence as well as for a new one. So, for instance, these people here from Extinction Rebellion, um, this is what uh, the link says. Uh, three Extinction Rebellion protesters who glued themselves to documents like railway train during the April Rebellion have been given a conditional discharge after a jury found them guilty with regret. So 
in the first Extinction Rebellion trial to reach the Crown Court, uh, Kathy Eastburn, Mark Overland and Luke Watson will not be punished unless they re-offend within 12 months. You can read the rest of that at your leisure. Uh, the link's there for you. So that gives you an idea of what a conditional discharge is. And then you've got an unconditional absolute discharge, and that's where the defendant is technically guilty or where a punishment would be inappropriate that's not classed as a conviction. So it's almost like the, the, the trauma of going through arrest, etc., and charging is punishment enough. Now, we've talked about formal sanctions, and of course the police can, that's what the courts can issue. The police can also issue formal sanctions in some minor offences. So they can issue cautions or penalty notices. So cautions, are warnings given by the police to anyone aged 10 or over for minor crimes such as graffiti. You can have conditional cautions, which means you have to stick to certain rules and restrictions, such as going for drug treatment for abuse. Uh, if you break the conditions, you get charged, or you get penalty notices for shoplifting, possession of cannabis, etc. So there's an example of a penalty notice. Um, often penalty notices are given on cars. You can see here the person has been given a 200 pound fine uh, for using a mobile phone whilst driving. So that's a penalty notice, and that will also be three points on the license as well, I think. Okay. Now, by now you should be quite clear of the definition of a crime, the definition of deviance, how the two um, can be similar and different at the same time. But what other implications are there of committing a criminal act? Well, uh, if you do, are found guilty of a crime, you can be excluded from certain occupations, such as working for young people. So, for instance, all teachers have to undergo a uh, disclosure and barring service check, a DBS check. So anyone that works with young people has to go through that. If you have committed any crimes related to young pe uh, people, you will not be allowed to work with them. That check will show it. You can be placed on the Violent Sex Offenders Register list, the VSOR. Um, if you're on that, there's certain things you can't do, places you can't go. There you go. Uh, you can be travel. You can have travel bans to certain countries. So, for instance, if you try and get into America and you've got a criminal record, good luck with you. You won't get in. Um, you can be have restrictions placed on things like adoption, jury service, standing for an MP, and you have to declare unspent convictions when you obtain insurance. And if you fail to do so, then your insurance becomes invalid. So there are implications of committing a criminal act. OK, and we move on to my final slide now, where we just try and move everything together and try and look at why this topic is so important, this idea between crime and deviant. And the idea that, remember back to my definition, that by definition, all crime is deviant. And we looked at some crimes which some people think may not be deviant anymore. This is how laws and attitudes in society changed. So not all acts that are classified as crimes are particularly serious, and some may be widely regarded as not even deviant. So for example, if we take possession of cannabis, it's a crime, but not that not a lot of so a lot of people do not regard it as particularly bad behaviour or indeed deviant because if a lot of people don't regard it, it's not going against the norms of society if most people are doing it. But matters are complicated further because there's always going to be a particular group of people in society that still regard that as deviant. So, for example, many other people do see possession of cannabis as morally wrong and hence deviant. Or we can look at those that consider things that are deviant but not necessarily criminal. So some acts that we see as deviant are not always um, crimes. For example, homosexuality um, between consenting adults is no longer illegal in the UK. So it's perfectly acceptable now under law, but some people still regard it as morally wrong and therefore regard it as deviant, even though technically it's not because it's, uh, it's legal. Prior to 1967, homosexuality was illegal in this country. It has changed. Prior to 1967, abortion was illegal in this country. It has changed. The law has changed. So this is how laws change, because as society's attitudes change, 
things that were considered to be deviant cease to be considered to be deviant and therefore laws change regarding them. And that's really important because you'll look at this when we move on to our future um, ACs, our future PowerPoints. So hopefully you've understood the difference between crime and deviance. You've got some definitions there. You've got some examples and I'll see you all on my next PowerPoint. Goodbye.